VA has a long history of innovation, and that success has led us to emerge as the clinical home for both academic and industry innovators who are seeking to develop, iterate, diffuse, and sustain high-value healthcare innovations. Our final plenary session of IEX will highlight the vast accumulated experience of VHA and our government colleagues and explore current strategies and future plans for VHA to serve as a powerful connector for healthcare innovation across both industry and government. There are few people better to kick off this conversation than Dr. Beth Ripley, Deputy Chief of the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning. Let's give a warm round of applause for Beth. Hey guys, how's it going? Yay, last session. And I could not come up here without, I wanted a whiteboard. Those who know me know I'm obsessed and I like to hold onto my pens. And Nick is so sweet and nice to me that she gave me this uh, kind, of, kind of a whiteboard. It's gonna count for a whiteboard. But so we're here to talk about connections, right? Connectivity, also known as collaboration, basically how we could work together with our partners both within VA and outside of VA. And I'm gonna start by saying that I think that pretty much any good or great project has collaborators. And, and don't get me wrong, I know there's amazing people out here in the audience, you guys are all awesome, but you're probably awesome with other people. And, and for example, let, I want anyone who's never collaborated to raise your hand. Just raise it high, raise it proud, never collaborated. No one? That's what I thought. Excellent, good job, you win, right? That's what, we don't do that. And so one of the fun things that I wanted to work on today is thinking about getting rid of this word. It's just one letter, one word, but why don't we just get rid of the whole concept of I, right, when we're talking about projects? Because I did this, I did that. What does that really mean? It means that I'm sitting around by myself thinking about what I need um, and making something for me, which is great if it's like a sandwich or like a smoothie, but if it's like a project for veterans, probably not such a great idea. Now, we could start with this next word, we, which is a great one, much better, right, than I, but make sure it's not this kind of a we, which is like my, this is my uh, royal we, which I looked up the definition of the royal we, which is, I'm going to say we, but you all know that I actually did all the work myself, and I'm just saying we to be kind of, you know, pretend like you did something, right? So no more royal we. And the word I want to do now is basically a new word, which is the VA we, which is how I think we should do all of our projects moving forward. And I know we do that, but I wanted just to up the ante a little bit with a game where I'm proposing, it's a challenge, I like challenges, it's a challenge, that next year I think that we should have an award for the projects that have the most collaborations, that can touch the most different silos, both within the VA and outside of the VA. Um, so I want people to start thinking about it now, and I want to try to capture some of the people that we already collaborate with, just to set the stage, because we're going to talk in a moment with a panel um, with some really amazing people that we could potentially collaborate with. So does anyone have a project out there where they're collaborating that they want to share? Yes, Indra, tell me. What? Just say, yell out, who, who are your collaborators? Ooh, good, yes, like it. This is pretty good. All right, so Indra right now, she's in the lead, right? <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Excellent, yes. Yes. 
Ooh, yes. Excellent. Wait, I missed that one. DSS. DSS. Yes. Yes. All the letters. Ooh, Indra, she's giving you a run. She's giving a run for your money. Well, 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 well. Um, other ones. Um, I, I think there's a million different groups out there. But I love this, and I just want to suggest that you start thinking about that map, because there's going to be a competition. Um, I'll give the winner $5. No, we'll figure something out. Um, but another game just to play, and again, I just wanted to set the stage, because this is a game that I play a lot with myself, is when I meet somebody new, especially if they're outside my walk of life, if they do something very different, the first thing I think is, how could I do a project with this person? Um, and it's kind of a fun mental game, right? Because sometimes you got to do some gymnastics. But I, I play this game pretty much every day in my head. And the crazier you can get a connection, the more magic that can come from it. Because that's where all the ideas come from, from the other walks of life that we're not normally used to. And in a moment, I'm going to talk about some of the, the walks of life that, that we've done between you know, VA and FDA and NIH and some other groups that are exciting. But I think you can play this game um, just about anywhere. And so with that, I'm going to stop because I want us to get started on the projects um, and the talks here. But I just want to remind you that we're going to do the VA We. We're going to have a game playing all year long. So start making your maps and thinking about all the different connections you can have um, and more to come on that. So let's go on. Good afternoon, folks. We're in the home stretch. Appreciate you all being with us. And to those that are tuning in, thanks for tuning in. I'm Ryan Vig. I have the pleasure of leading the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning. Uh, and I'll hand it off to the panel to let them introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nat Higgins. I'm a program manager for the Defense Innovation Unit, which is an organization under the, the DOD. Hey everyone, Sandeep Patel. I am the uh, director of BARDA's Division of Research Innovation, or DRIVE, which is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dora Hughes. I'm the chief medical officer of the CMS Innovation Center, which is at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And my name is Beth Ripley. I'm part of VA. I'm the deputy chief for OHA. Well, thanks for being here, panel. It's purposeful that we have individuals from government because the whole of government had to respond to a once in generation pandemic over the past two years. And what we're gonna explore today is both the importance of partnerships, public, private, interagencies, the necessity as we go forward, but also what makes them work really well. Uh, so Sandy, but probably good to start with you given uh, the immense amount of work that you all were responsible for during the pandemic. How do you see the, the secret recipe or the secret ingredients that made the public-private partnerships work both during the pandemic and what's gonna be necessary as we move forward? Yeah, sure, so just, just a level set on BARDA, if you're not familiar, where uh, our, our goal at BARDA is to develop life-saving medical countermeasures in the context of public health emergencies. And we do this through public-private partnerships with our industry partners, our government partners, and others. Um, we've gotten, through our partners, 65 products through, through FDA licensure in our, our 16 years. And I think that the key part of this is, is I mean, is, is truly these partnerships. I think that, you know, bringing a vaccine to life, it, it takes an incredible amount of risk. And, and, you know, A, you have to share that across, you know, multiple entities. Um, there's just a lot of a lot that goes into it, and, and I think the the partnerships that we saw that are were successful um, during COVID nineteen were the ones that were existed beforehand and that were strengthened during the pandemic. We work very closely with the Department of Defense, with NIH, with the VA, with many other uh, colleagues around the federal government, and we just saw that strengthened during during the, the the pandemic. And so I think you know going forward, and we can obviously talk about this all day. Um, I think it's really important for us to think about sort of how do we connect, create that connective glue so that, you know, especially when unexpected things happen, we have channels to communicate, to collaborate, uh, to work in new ways without having to create things from scratch. And Beth, a few weeks ago, you, mostly you, uh, and a number of colleagues from the VA made an announcement. We. We. So made, made an announcement no, a uh, about a partnership with the FDA. And the work that that will entail in terms of helping to better test and evaluate 
Talk to us a little bit about the importance of that partnership, but what that means for our other collective partners. Yeah, absolutely. So this is truly a VA we, but it's actually an intergovernmental we. So um, this partnership is bringing together the FDA and VA under one roof to think creatively about regulatory science tools. So you might say, what is that? What's a regulatory science tool and why do I care? Well, the FDA, um, and I, I obviously don't speak for them, but I will speak as I understand it, right? The FDA's job is to make sure that the devices and the drugs that we get are safe and effective, right? And so you make something incredible, right, with your colleagues, and you need to then demonstrate, if, it, if it's something that's regulated by the FDA, you need to demonstrate that it's safe and it's effective. So you need data and evidence to do this. But what data and evidence, you might ask? And, th and that's where a lot of projects go to die, because it's really hard sometimes to know what do they want. You have to kind of read their mind. Um, and if you're talking about a new emerging technology, no one may know how to figure out if it's safe or effective. So regulatory science tools are a way of making, a, an, actually like an off-the-shelf testing and evaluation strategy that's accessible to every innovator um, regardless of who you are, you don't have to pay for it, you can get it, you can learn it, that's going to help you know exactly what you need to do to show that your device is safe and effective. And we're going to be working on that together in this collaboration. What that's going to do is keep you from meandering down a path trying to find your way to, you know, whatever the FDA might need. It's going to set you on the straight and narrow, so you're going to save money and time. Um, and, and that's kind of the gist of it. Um, but we think this is going to be a huge enabler for innovators, and particularly those innovators that don't have a lot of capital or maybe experience in this space before, and also for those innovators that are working in the emerging technologies that we don't know a, uh, a lot about, because we're going to sit there together and think about what is safe and what is effective using the VA staff to really drive that. And ultimately, you need to pay for these things. As we see such great innovations become translated into clinical practice, we have to pay for them. And not always do we see the care model or the financial models aligned to drive not necessarily the adoption, but the use. And Laura, it's kind of the world that you all live in, right? So how do you all think about uh, not only the necessity of this, but your partnerships become very different. You have to partner with the provider community. Uh, and so how do you all think about that, the role of that partnership, but also the necessity to really think and align those incentives? Yeah, it's such an important issue. And as I was listening to Beth, I was thinking, for FDA, you have to demonstrate safety and effectiveness. For CMS, you have to demonstrate that your product is medically reasonable and necessary. And so different standards. Um, our beneficiaries, we house the Medicare program. So most of the beneficiaries are 65 and older although it also includes those with disabilities and who qualify for other reasons. And so we want to know how, not just how this product work generally, but how does it work in, the, in this case, potentially the senior population. Uh, we also house the Medicaid program at CMS. And so thinking through the different populations, uh, a product may work very differently in a pregnant woman or in a child uh, than it does in the elderly person, of course. And so those are the types of uh, evidentiary standards that we have to meet on our end to uh, be assured that the coverage, again, is medically reasonably, uh, medically reasonable and necessary. And as part of that, almost in some ways, a continuum of the conversations that FDA is having within government, uh, our administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashore and Commissioner Califf, um have begun to meet at a very senior level just to think about what are the priorities between the agencies? What are the challenges? And more importantly, what are the opportunities to make this uh, continuum of, of uh, approval, uh, marketing to coverage, access? How can we make that as seamless as possible, uh, particularly with those, the, the manufacturers and uh, the device uh, industry that they're having to go through this process? Uh, it's in everyone's interest, both for the providers, especially for the patients. Um, that we make this process of, as efficient as possible. Thanks. And that you, you have a, a very unique mission that sometimes can feel not foreign, but distant to those who want to engage. 
How do you broker some of that chasm to say a lot of what we may be doing actually has applicability broader or to the commercial side and bring those incentives together where your mission can align to a broader mission? Yeah, so uh, we joke a lot in the government about stovepipes, right? I mean, it, it's not just the government, but large corporations. You, you see these types of things everywhere. But the, the silo effect is a very real thing, um, if you let it be a real thing. Uh, but the best way to overcome barriers like that is to identify common goals that you have with other organizations. So on the surface, you'd probably look at, you know, who I work for the Department of Defense and, and think healthcare, like, what are they doing here? But in reality, we have a healthcare system that, you know, consists of 9 million personnel throughout the DOD, military services, et cetera. It's one of the largest healthcare systems in the world. And if you think about, you know, from a continuity of, of operations perspective, our warfighters become VA patients eventually. So there is already so much commonality right there that we should be, you know, working around. So from there, it's, you know, the relationship that we've formed with the VA has really been about, let's take the next conscious step together and let's identify a shared vision so that we can achieve these, you know, where we have this Venn diagram of commonality Let's work together so that we're not, you know, uh, stepping on each other's toes and, and we're doing this in a complementary fashion. And so um, through that, we've just made a conscious effort to identify all of the, you know, the areas where we have alignment. And, you know, again, going back to the healthcare piece, we're often looking at the same types of emerging technologies that we want to adopt in the DOD as the folks in the VA are. And so what we've done is just worked around those synergies. Like, hey, what do you have? If you're further along, instead of me wasting investments in the same area, like, let me capture what you've done and recreate it and vice versa. And so from that, beautiful partnerships have formed. Um, we've, shaped, we've shared technologies, everything from uh, drones that can deliver blood supplies and prescriptions to uh, the, like the augmented reality microscope that you saw my colleague present earlier. And that has all been in cooperation with the VA because of that common foundation. Thanks. As we think about this idea of connector, it really, in my mind, becomes about what's the role of government? And that's something that became far more visible out of necessity. But as each of you all think, and, and Sandeep, from, from the Barter perspective, how have you be, begun articulating what you all see as the role for government moving forward as this convener, as this connector for whether it's early stage innovations or ventures or even more broadly applicable to new care models? Yeah, ha happy to jump in on that. Um, so I think let's just take the... COVID-19 pandemic um, in certain context, right? I think, you know, one, in terms of response, I think we have to do a lot better than, than we did. I think that, you know, we're talking about a, a million American lives lost, over 22,000 veteran lives lost. You know, clearly we just need to do a lot better. Um, when, when we look at sort of what happened, I think a lot of things went right. Like we developed a, a once in a century sort of, you know, vaccine, an entirely new platform in record time. Um, but it still took nine months to get to, to that point. It took a, a, about eight months to get a, the first therapy approved. It took about a year to get the first, you know, COVID test. And I think, you know, when I look at sort of the future and I think, well, how are we going to do better? I think we have to shorten that timeline. We have to have those things ready on day one before a pandemic actually becomes a pandemic. And, and so there's a lot of exciting technologies that are, that are uh, uh, on the brink that, that can get us there. Things like you know, using your smartphone and your cameras and, and, the, and the microphones to, to detect, you know, respiratory infections or uh, presence of other, you know, markers of infection, uh, tools to detect, you know, whether you might actually get really sick from an infection or have a mild version. Um, next generation uh, vaccines that can, um, um, you know, work across multiple families of viruses and things like that. So there's an incredible amount of stuff going on. The problem is that th there's incredible risk to developing technologies. And I think, you know, industry alone is not going to do it. Um, I think it requires a, a vision that comes from government and, and the, the know-how that comes from industry. Partners like the VA, I think one of the things that we saw, you know, if you're going to shorten that timeline, we have to do clinical trials better, right? You know, I think, I think accessing patients where they're at uh, in a way that makes sense, uh, both from a recruitment, a retainment, uh, a monitoring perspective, I think is crucial to response. And I think developing these kind of partnerships where you share capabilities together, I think is going to be critical. So, yeah. So. Uh, Ned, how, how do we de-risk? <laughs> Great question, I, and I just—I was just going to piggyback on that. I, um, there's a saying, right? It, you know, if we forget history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? And I, I don't know what Burke meant when he said it at that time, but I know for us right now, uh, to the point that that was just made, you know, for from a market economic standpoint, commercial companies—they're not going to necessarily continue to produce solutions that um, you know will carry us through the next pandemic because it's not profitable for them. But for us on the government side, we bear the responsibility of continuing to build out those technologies in anticipation of future crises like this, right? Like that's our responsibility. 
So I think it's on us to really continue to share that load and follow through on these you know, innovative technologies and practices that we've been building on. So I think that that is sort of the, the load that we, that we bear there. Um, and then you know, in terms of, of how we can turn that into reality, um, I, I'll just give an example from, from us, right? So we, uh, you know, we've been practicing some fairly Byzantine era procurement practices for a long time, right? Like I, I see this audience, I know a lot of you have worked on very frustrating RFPs and, and FAR-based acquisition, that kind of stuff. And I do not mean to discourage it, like it was built out of necessity, it was relevant at a time, but now we're finding that we need more accelerated vehicles to be able to acquire these types of innovative technologies and so, you know, for us, at least on our side, it's how can we work within the confines of, you know, the policies and regulations that, that, uh, that we abide by, but still find, you know, vehicles to rapidly adopt these types of technologies. And so, somehow, you know, we've been able to do it. We're using uh, new authorities that basically have taken us from, you know, acquiring technologies that would have taken probably up to two years to put onto award to we're doing it now in 90 days. And so, we're just trying to find ways to um, work within the system to remove those barriers that otherwise would have prevented us from this type of rapid iterating and, and technology adoption. And Dora, when we think about medical necessity, and even, even before that, uh, demonstrating that some, there's some evidentiary standard to a therapeutic, how do we reimagine those workflows so that we're getting solutions into the hands of patients fast, and Beth chime in as well, but safely? And that tension I always see as a real challenge for clinicians and for patients. Right, such an important issue. I, of course, I do want to go back just a half step. I was, a, in some ways, a, as I think about how we work with the VA and other federal partners, it is leveraging the knowledge that uh, the VA already has or the way that they practice, the evidence that they already have. But in some cases, we're also learning together and moving forward and trying out new approaches. And I, that flashed in my head in part because I was listening to Nathaniel and I was like, Interestingly, the last uh, outreach from an uh, individual at the DOD was about doulas for women who are pregnant. And you never think about the DOD and how are we helping, we're working with doulas, community-based uh, providers uh, for, for uh, women who are giving birth. And, and that's also obviously for CMS, it's traditionally not an area that even five, definitely not 10 years ago that we focused on how we provide coverage. And so I always like kind of um, the way that we're both learning, but then also learning from each other uh, in, in different cases. Um, for us, the evidentiary standards, it, it's, uh, we rely very heavily on our, our provider base, our, our hospital health system partners, um, as we decide, uh, make these decisions, and we have a formal coverage group but I also think it's important that increasingly we are also listening to our beneficiaries and bringing in the patient voice to understand like we know what we think is medically reasonable and necessary, but through the beneficiary, the end user, how, what are their values and how do they think about it? And certainly um, how do we incorporate that lens into our decision making? And so that's um, one uh, component of the decision making. And what does that mean for evidentiary standard? I mean, cer certainly that's a challenging area uh, for us. And that's also, um, as we think about, I'll give one example in terms of working with the VA. We have signaled at the CMS Innovation Center that we're interested in thinking about how do we improve care for uh, our beneficiaries with dementia? Uh, and of course, that uh, is a common priority and one that VA is obviously a leader and, and, and providing care for those with dementia, uh, elderly populations, but also for caregivers. And for us, that's also a new area of focus. How do we help not only the beneficiary, the patient, but also the family and friends who are helping to care for that individual? And again, gets back to, and what would the evidentiary standard for that be? How do we make the decisions there? In the Innovation Center, we're able to kind of push the envelope and think about how we test uh, are there flexibilities or different types of payments that could support um, this more holistic care? Um, but that is a, certainly a, will be a, a challenge for us and I think for many of our private sector uh, partners as well. That's so cool. I love that. I know. I feel like this is going to be a wee moment. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I already I'm have gonna, plans I'm for you. Yes. Board. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, have. I see Can that. We bring the end. board back out so we. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I think, you know, you said about de-risking, just coming back to that for a second, and how do we convene and connect, and where's the role of government? There's a, a few things that 
I think are really important for us. One thing is that we all, all of us in the government have missions. They're slightly different, but we all serve the American public. And I think um, all of our work and the things that we do belong in the public domain. So one thing that we can do is be transparent in a way that others can't. And when we're talking about you know, things like medical device or treatment development, a lot of times those things are very proprietary and they have to be to protect the people that are making them. But I think there's parts of the process that we can peel out and expose to the general public in a way that builds and grows the trust. For example, COVID-19, yes, we're all sick of it, but we learned a lot, right? Um, and one of the partnerships that we did was between the VA, the FDA, NIH, and um, America Makes around PPE. Um, and this is when people were trying to figure out how to make PPE early on. And a lot of people were sewing masks, 3D printing masks, DIYing masks. Um, and it was great, but how do you know which ones are safe and which ones aren't? So we came together all those government agencies to bring the particular experience each one of us had. So VA, the clinical experience to understand what does the mask really need to do? Like what are the minimum basics? The FDA, what does safe and effective look like? And the NIH in this part was playing the role as data shepherd. How do we make sure that the data that we're sharing out is attainable and can be reached by the entire um, country and actually the world at this point? Um, and so we each sliced off a piece of that pie that we did the best. We put it all together. We talked about it early, often. We put it on social media. Um, we talked to anyone who would, wanted to talk to us. And we tried to build that transparency and the trust together. So again, the people could still protect their proprietary information, but by sending it through us, we could at least put a stamp on it or a seal on it to say that, you know, we've thought about it through these different lenses, clinical, you know, scientific, regulatory, um, and, and we think it's okay. And I think that we need to do more of that. You know, as you said, like the beneficiary, what is the end user um, getting and don't they deserve to know it? And so how can we continue to do that work together to really bring that trust and transparency, I think is, is a key piece of what we're trying to do here. Great. We're starting to see more unconventional partnerships in healthcare. Now that's a result of new market players, uh, and it's a result of taking a step back and sometimes thinking more broadly about your core mission. Each one of us has a very specific mission and our very focus. How do you all balance that? How do you all force yourselves out of your comfort zone sometimes to think more broadly and to find those unconventional partnerships that could potentially be transformative? I'll start, uh, at least, you know, as an example, the partnership we have with the VA really came out of necessity. Um, we are basically a DOD outpost in Silicon Valley. We don't have a lot of other government entities around us to, to be thought partners, et cetera. And so when we're working on prototypes, a lot of times what we need is, uh, a, you know, a government backyard to test and evaluate these types of things. And, and that is often, no matter how fast we procure this stuff, like that's often an obstacle for us. And so out of necessity, and it actually goes back to the Microco project, if any of you saw that, that, that technology um, was put together in fairly rapid process. Uh, however, we couldn't find a, a nearby uh, clinical background, basically, for us to do the testing. So the only other, other uh, federal organization we had around us was VA Palo Alto, and we were like, well, all right, like, let's just try it. So we called it, and they were just like, yeah, how fast can you get it here? And so that was basically you know, the starting point of a beautiful relationship, and that was you know, Tom Osborne and, and Kristen Jensen just said, yeah, come on in, come on in, open their doors for us, and, and now you know, we're, we're putting our DOD prototypes at VA Fusion Sound with Beth and, and Josh Patterson, we're at VA Minnesota, and so it's just kind of like, yeah, why not leverage these types of relationships if it gets us over the hump and prevents you know, us from stalling out in the valley of death, then absolutely we should be leveraging these resources because at the end of the day, it is, you know, a common resource. Yeah, so one example for, from our, you know, perspective is, you know, we're, we're, we're focused at BARDA on, on infectious disease and, and right. public health emergencies. And I think this is, a, as was mentioned earlier, a historically uh, underinvested space. It doesn't have many, much incentive from, from private investors to invest in. And we see lots of companies start on this journey but divert somewhere else where, where there's more money. And so. You know, one of the partnerships we started last year was, was you know, um, 
trying to tackle that problem more directly, we partnered with a, a group called the Global Health Investment Corporation in a program called Barta Ventures, which you know, is a, is a public-private venture capital equity finance investment. And, and our goal here was, look, we want to, A, meet these companies where they're at. Um, we want to find different ways to influence their trajectory, right? Instead of, um, you know, trying to, to force a square peg in a round hole, we're going to work with them really closely, um, you know, as a typical venture capital investor would, and, and, and kind of, like, help them develop a use case that could be used for public health emergencies. And, and at the same time, to actually... Uh, softly convince the, the 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 world of private investment, where there's a lot of capital sitting around, um, to invest in these areas that are important for us in national national health security. Um, so it's an incredibly different partnership for us, but one that you know I think is going to bear a lot of fruit in the future. Yeah. A partnership that would be newer for us. You know, I always think for CMS again, we sit we have historically sat in the clinical space, and so if you want to talk to us about how to take care of patients with heart disease or diabetes. I mean, we're, we're, good, we're good there. Um, but as over the last three, five years, and certainly brought into sharp relief with during the COVID pandemic, is the need to really think about the uh, health-related social needs or the non-medical uh, uh, issues that can really have a profound impact on, uh, on our health, everyone's health, and certainly our beneficiaries. Uh, we, it was dr kind of drummed into us by our colleagues at CDC that uh, upwards 70, 80 percent of what contributes to health in the long term, longevity, happens uh, from factors that are outside of the clinic setting or outside of the hospital setting. And so we really need to think about uh, what are the housing needs of our beneficiaries? Are they having food insecurity? Are they having problems with transportation? All of these uh, social determinants of health, as we call them, and that's not historically been a, a set of issues that at CMS we have focused on. We've been very much in our clinical lane. And so that has forced us uh, increasingly to reach outside of our wheelhouse and think about uh, our partners, whether it's CDC I mentioned, or the Administration for Community Living, or the VA. We also reached out to uh, discuss how do we measure underservedness of communities. It's a pretty wonky issue. but. For the VA, they've, they have veterans in rural areas, they have veterans that are homeless, they have veterans that are low income. I mean, across every walk of life, every geography, every uh, type of demographic or <clears throat> social feature. So it's been another area where we've been able to learn. The VA has had a, a major footprint in so many different communities, and that's really helped to expand our thinking about what are some of the things we can do as one of the nation's uh, largest payers uh, to support uh, the integration of clinical and community health care. Steph? Yeah, so I'm going to take a different approach. I'm just thinking about this and, again, some of the collaborations and, and missions and driving missions together. Sometimes the best things come just from wanting to work with cool people that you like, right? Um, and, you know, the, the FDA, VA, NIH, America Makes, uh, collaboration that we started during the pandemic. Yeah, see, come. Cool yeah, people. well, you're gonna you're gonna join, right? I told you before. I was like, let's do something. Yes, we we want you to join us. But um, you know, we all knew each other beforehand, just because we we're you know on the same in the same circles or talking, etc. So it was actually very easy that when the problem came up, we could all call each other, text each other, and say, hey, how can we do something together? So it actually was a little bit of like back-ending, like how do we bring all our missions together? And I think that is okay. Sometimes it's not, you know, it doesn't start with this grand vision and then the people come down from, you know, the sky. You know, sometimes it's just cool people in a room trying to figure out how to do stuff together. Um, and those are the best projects. You know, if you hear like Nobel Prize winners, oftentimes they say like, oh, I, you know, I just really wanted to work with my friend Frank over in, you know, wherever. So I think that we have our mission and we focus on that, but sometimes it's just finding good people. Um, and, I, you know, Bryn said it, uh, this was really great when she said really in the end medicine is humans taking care of humans. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. And I think we should be okay with being our human selves and wanting to do cool things together um, and, and back end the mission in sometimes. Why not? So on panels for partnerships, I also hear, always hear folks talk about, tell us what makes partnerships work. And you get general, generic, and standard answers. So we're going to flip that a little bit on its head. Why do partnerships fail? 
Yeah, I can think of a lot of reasons why they fail. Um, however, I've been fortunate enough to be in some really good partnerships with, you know, with, uh, with folks in the VA and, and some other organizations right now. But okay, so I think that um, a lot of times I talked about the stovepiping effect. Um, we have this tendency to want to monopolize uh, certain capabilities because we want to take credit for developing them, you know, whatever it is, basically. Um, you know, when the government, people aren't necessarily monetarily incentivized, like it's, it comes from the credit you get from these transformational things you do. And so sometimes we'll, we, you know, we'll, we'll silo those types of efforts when we should really be sharing resources because in the end, if you do, everyone's gonna get credit for it, right? Like, like if you both do the homework assignment, you both get credit for it. Um, and you get to share your resources in the process. So for me, I think it's really about uh, ident okay, so first it's about, you look at that Venn diagram, right? Like, like find some, like, some common goals and where do they overlap? And again, we all have healthcare in common here. Maybe not exactly the same mission, but we have that to start with. And then if you want to take it a step further, it becomes about, okay, let's, you know, let's identify a shared vision of how we can go about doing these things that we share over here. And when you get to that point, you're, you're talking about crystallizing it. And you know, we do that in various forms, MO, MOAs, MOUs, sometimes more formal processes where we can share resources like money and that kind of stuff. And once you get to that point, you know, as long as you are establishing that foundation in such a way that it complements, your, you know, you're, you're leaning on each other's competitive advantages instead of, instead of stepping on toes, then right there you have the foundation of what is a good relationship. But if you don't take those steps, if you're not intentional about it, if you don't make sure that what you're doing is complementary with the, your, I, I think that you are possibly headed for uh, rough seas. Andy? By the way, I think that'd be a good book, 101 Reasons Why Partnerships Fail. Yeah. I, like, yeah. I was sort of thinking about this. But I'll give we you, can write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you three real quick. I think one is, I mean, to Beth's point here, I think, you know, uh, when it doesn't start with two people wanting to do something specific. And I think, I think sometimes we just think about it too vaguely. Like, we just want to work with, you know, together because it just makes sense. You know, I think that's, a, that's doomed to fail because you, you don't have that one spark, right, that's driving it. Um, and the second one that, that I'll mention is that I think sometimes we tend to look at partnering with groups that do the same thing we do or are like us, and I think we got to clearly do the opposite. I don't want to work with someone who fun, you know, does what we do. I want something that you know, does, brings something completely different to the table, right? And sometimes those groups are hard to find. We don't know about them, and it takes a little while to kind of reach out to, to them. Yeah. There's more, but I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I would, I would name two things. The first that came to mind is that there's always a tension between being aspirational and pragmatic. And in many groups, uh, sometimes it's really hard to focus on, but these are the things that we can get done uh, as opposed to these are the things that we could do. I also feel like for the federal agencies, we often get lost in our own statutory authorities. And um, I was bemused when I first joined CMS. I wanted some provider data that one of our, our centers collects, the Center for Program Integrity. And so you know, I asked if you could send the data over, and they're like, oh, no, we can't share that data. And I'm like, I thought our tagline is one, one CMS. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, but now when it comes to data sharing. So, so I feel like um, sometimes just those restrictions are actually real barriers uh, in the absence of of uh, congressional intervention for good reasons in terms of privacy and security and all of that, but it could be um, certainly a real challenge. You know, I think I kind of already alluded to this, but if you don't like who you're working with, it's gonna fail, right? So making sure that you have a, a true, like a good relationship with the people that you're working with, that you're excited about them, I think is a huge piece of this. And I think that comes back to the we again. Um, Spoiler alert, if you're an I person, people probably don't want to work with you after they figure that out. You know, if it's I, 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 um, you know, you get, you get to show off what you did, but then no one's going to play with you the next time, right, at the playground. So I think, again, um, stepping back, enjoying the group, you know, really bonding with the people that you're working with and seeing that you're, you have a shared interest and by doing it together, it's going to be more fun, it's going to go further. Um, and, and you're going to get things done, I think, is, is what you need to succeed. So sticking with you as we sort of near the, the end of this panel, we all are seeing an enormous amount of both challenges and opportunities. What are some of the things that you see as those real great challenges and areas where you want to see more partnerships to solve them? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, I think we've heard some really great things today about, and yesterday, 
about all the determinants of health that we don't normally think about, right? We talked about um, transportation, we talked about food security, we talked about, you know, um, feeling like you're part of a community. We did some amazing kind of exercise and meditation things. So I, I think if we could be challenged on how do we make those part of our health, truly part of our healthcare armamentarium, right? We're not just talking about them here in IEX, but we're talking at them across the United States and that we're somehow paying for them um, or reimbursing or getting them back. I think that would be, you know, a big hairy goal. Right, but I think a cool one. So. so that's a tough one. I, I, I guess going in reverse order, I never did state what the CMS Innovation Center does since part of the introductions. We were created as part of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and our statutory charge is to improve the quality of care and reduce the cost of care. And ideally both, but at least one or the other for all of our what we call models, which are essentially our large research demonstrations. And so I, even 10 years later, we're still seeing tremendous gaps in quality uh, and we have not made the impact that we would have liked to have had on cost. And so those are the issues um, that we are laser focused and I still think could be very helpful uh, in working closely with the VA whether it's in the context of a certain disease uh, condition, if it's in the context of a certain provider type, uh, we're focusing on primary care as a specialist, if it's focusing on a certain community, I mentioned rural as an example. Those are the types of issues that uh, even for our next 10 years that we think of ourselves in 10-year goals that uh, we think that partnerships with VA and our other fellow colleagues would be especially helpful. Cindy. Uh, I'll give you one example of a challenge that's been on my mind that I think is going to require a completely new set of partnerships. So I think, I think we have the tools today, especially with COVID, to take seasonal influenza off the table. To, um, and I think, you know, when you, when you think about sort of the tools, right, combining surveillance, diagnostics, um, precision use of, of masks and PPEs, upgrading air, air filtration, precisely deploying, you know, therapeutics and vaccines as, as we need them, you know, better tools to signal whether someone's infectious and things like that. And I think applying these tools in a concerted way, in the, in the right way to actually eliminate seasonal influenza is gonna require not a, a leap of technolo technological development, we've already done that, it's gonna require partnerships on the ground to effectively deploy them and to buy into that. So I think that's just gonna, one, one of those things that, you know, if we get that right, it'll, we, we could achieve that. Yeah, so this, uh, I really wanna avoid sensationalist headlines right now. So um, this is Nat's idea, not the DOD's. <laughs> um, I, uh, so, uh, my first job in the world was an uh, army officer, and I remember one of the one of the most impactful things my company commander said to me was, you know, as an officer, when you're questioning what you should do in certain situations, remember the reason you get paid more money is to take more risks. And that, for some reason, has stuck with me. Um, and I think that sort of translates into the government realm. And I, I don't want to say unethical, stupid, irresponsible risks, but I think when you're talking about the broader commercial landscape and our ability to, you know, to potentially take advantage of these super transformational innovative technologies, I think we and the government can take a little bit more risks on technologies whose horizons might be further out, but if, you know, if you're looking at the, the risk versus reward quad chart that are up in that corner where it's really risky, but also such a huge payoff, like I think we can make, take more risks in those types of technology areas. Um, whether it's looking at you know, distributed ledger technology and taking advantage of its you know, ability to potentially help us free up data um, that we have troves of that could lead to other, you know, very valuable insight yielding technologies or whatnot. Things that we're like, I'm not sure about that, but if it pays off the way I think it will, it, I mean, it could have, uh, you know, a multiplier effect beyond just the government and, and throughout, you know, global healthcare, et cetera. I, I, I really think that, like, there's a way to capture um, or to take very calculated risks that way and, and, you know, base them off of educated venture guests and that kind of thing. Last minute, rapid fire. You have made the decision uh, individually that you're gonna climb Mount Enverus. You get to partner with one superhero. Who is it, Matt? Oh my gosh, okay, all right. So for me, um, I think it would be, I'm trying to think of something like really out of the box here, but it would probably be Batman just because he has so much gear. Like you know that he's got some kind of <laughs> like e-textile jacket that's heated inside and just an oxygen mask that comes out of nowhere and probably a rocket pack, so I'm gonna go with that. Sandy. Can I pick Beth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Probably a bad idea. 
are you cool enough? Um, no, uh, of course, I immediately thought back to my youth. I'm like, I would have to be Wonder Woman. But then I was like, could be Wakanda forever, though. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah. Yeah. Beth? I love Deadpool. What can I say? Yeah. I'll be laughing when I die. But <laughs> <laughs> and maximum effort. So. Perfect. Well, round of applause for the panel. And we've got a few minutes for questions, if anyone has anything for the, Dr. Wiltz. Hi, uh, so one of my questions, and coming off of what you were saying there towards the end, when we look at how healthcare is paid for in the United States, um, there's not money to be made off of helping really the people that need it the most. The argument can be made, or is often made, that government is there to protect people, um, particularly the most vulnerable of our people. And the bottom line is that a lot of how we pay things is you get more money for doing surgeries than you do for preventing someone's hypertension for 20 years. Companies, insurance companies, don't have the incentive to keep you healthy for the next five or 10 years because you're gonna change plans or whatever it is. So, I mean, one of the things that we really have valued in VA is that our veterans are doing better than the, than the private sector population when it comes to things like social determinants of health. We've had numerous studies, uh, you know, black men and white men have, have uh, similar survival rates from prostate cancer, vastly different. So, with that set up, my question is really with, with all of this government thought, how do we change the script for American healthcare to protect our most vulnerable and ultimately maybe change the way you know, our private sector hospitals and insurers actually take care of people? I mean, if we have the opportunity to do this with our veterans, if we have the opportunity to do it on Medicaid and Medicare, then can we change the system overall? So I'm happy to start as, as one. Everyone looked at Dora. But uh, in terms of Innovation Center, I mean, in fact, that's, that's one of the issues that we're quite focused on. Uh, how do we incentivize or at least support providers who are taking care of a disproportionate number of underserved beneficiaries? And in some of our models, again, that's how we label our demonstrations, we're actually providing additional funding on top of what they would otherwise have received. And so, uh, as one example, in our, in our ACO REACH model that was announced in March of this year and it'll roll out, it'll start in January of next year, uh, ACO REACH realizing equity, uh, accountable um, uh, health, accountable uh, community health. Um, we provide a health equity benchmark adjustment, so you actually get a plus up uh, for those providers that are taking care of the most, uh, num the highest numbers of underserved beneficiaries. And another model, we actually focusing on those uh, that qualify for Medicaid and Medicare, again, they're getting a plus up, an additional payment on top of what they would have otherwise received. So we, I think we're not really sure. This is our first foray. This may fail in terms of do we provide the right level of additional payment? Are we still reaching the right number of providers? What are the supports? What's the timing of the payments? Do they need it up front? Or, you know, all of that, that's part of our test, our model test. Um, but we do think we have to recognize and uh, support uh, those that are taking care of both clinically, medically, as well as socially complex patients. Uh, and that's um, uh, one of our, we have five pillars uh, for in terms of our strategies and advancing equity is one of them and the payment is, is a key part of that. have a two-part question. The first is, are you partnering with other private partnerships as well in like the IACT, IACT, Emerging Technologies as well for the, in that area? Also, have you also considered the other partnerships, uh, like in the springtime they had the VA DOD um, where they got together in Pittsburgh and 
with like uh, Catherine Lair Simone, she did the Defense Health Agency in research. She did a lot of work there with, with, with a lot of partnerships with research there with, together. Have you done some work with them? From, from the VA's perspective, I, I, the, the short answer is yes to both. I know we have extensive partnerships, both interagency and uh, with our, our private sector colleagues. And I think those have been both vital in advancing the work that we're doing uh, and have also been educational in terms of how we better partner. Yeah, I, uh, I honestly, I, I couldn't say it better myself. I, you know, one of our pillars is accelerating the adoption of commercial technology. Like, we don't always know what the best technology is, so that's why we partner with companies that can guide us in the right direction. Um, you know, as long as we find a way to tell them what our problem is, not what requirements we need, we find we get better solutions, and, and so those partnerships are crucial. I'll add a BARDA perspective. I think, you know, one of the core pillars of BARDA, I didn't mention this earlier, is that we, you know, we, we have funding partnerships with industry, right, you know, and across multiple domains, but, but I think the key sort of secret sauce is that we don't write checks and walk away. We create integrated project teams with our partners to, to co-develop uh, all of our work, and so uh, it's just a key part, and there's learning that happens in both directions um, along the way. Good afternoon, my name is Aima Obriango. I'm with the team that developed the Pathfinder program with IE. So my question is, it's, it's kind of building on what she asked, but understanding that nobody owns innovation and actually innovation works best when it's spread because we don't know where the best ideas are gonna come from. Part of a lot of our discovery, we worked with um, state level VAs, local, local VAMCs, um, VSOs, smaller businesses, and they also have like a really large role to play in innovation within VA. So my question is, this session is considered, is called VA as a connector. What role is the national VA planning to play in connecting these smaller sort of, I wouldn't say grassroots, but not national level, but still very important part of the innovation conversation. How is VA planning to connect those to the resources they need to bring the next level of you know, solutions to veterans? Thank you. It's a great question. I'll answer from the VA and then if you all have areas to weigh in. I think it's really hard to play the role of a connector unless you have the infrastructure to be a connector. And one of the things that has been very purposeful over the past couple of years is building uh, and investing in the human capital. That's not just within VA, but that is the relationships with these folks on stage and with folks across the federal government. If you don't have those relationships to be able to tap into their expertise and their infrastructure, it's really hard to be a connector. Second is you have to be purposeful about that infrastructure. So projects and memorandums of understanding are great, but it's gonna be the brain trust of folks like Beth and her colleagues at the FDA to actualize those resources to bear and show that by us coming together, we can accelerate our time to making evidence-based decisions to understanding the real world impact of solutions in a more timely manner. So I think that's really, and I believe strongly, that that's really how you become a connector, is you have to have the infrastructure. The best analogy is to say, and I want to open up a venue that brings people together to listen to music. But I have no ability to book. I have no sound system. I can never play that role if I don't have that infrastructure. I would, I would also offer from CMS's perspective, uh, your comments are just spot on and really resonates uh, with us. We are more purposely partnering with states, uh, and, but also with communities within states. And I think to Ryan's point, understanding the infrastructure needs. And so in many of our demonstrations, we used to just say, we're gonna start this project with this state or this community you know, in six months, and then it moved to a year. And now we're recognizing it could take up to two years uh, for us to build a really strong relationship in terms of our relationships, federal to state or local, but also within the state and local, uh, and that there needs to be sufficient infrastructure funding so they can purchase the technologies or whatever tools or set up the learning supports 
um, and really to, or to uh, figure out the data sharing capabilities, all of that infrastructure work that takes a lot more time when you work with community states, but will pay off much just in dividends and allow our work to be more sustainable over time. So I think um, increasingly, certainly for us, uh, we're starting to very much uh, appreciate the importance and putting our money where our mouth is in terms of how can we uh, invest in these, in these uh, what are our commitments at the state and local level. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. My name is George Akingba. I'm a, a surgeon at the DCVA. I work with Ryan. And um, I, I don't know if everybody in, in this room knows, but CPRS is the first uh, electronic medical record system in the world. It was developed with a partnership between the VA, SRI, Stanford Research Institute, DARPA, and the United States Navy. So I, I, we use it all the time, and uh, it's the backbone of all the other EMRs, and it was provided free to everybody in the world. So that's kudos to the VA for that. All right, one last round of applause for the panel.